The tensile strength of a carbon nanotube is almost unbelievable compared to some other materials. Welcome to Nano Matters, the podcast that explores specific examples of nanotechnology. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Here with me today is Mark Banish, President of NeoTerracon, a nanomaterials company. So Mark, what is a carbon nanotube? A carbon nanotube is a unique form of carbon and it forms into a hexagon pattern. Those hexagons interlock and form a tubular structure. Now, when you do this, the carbon has one electron left over and that electron can become delocalized, meaning that it's free to move anywhere up the tube of hexagons that make up the carbon nanotube. The tube can be small, It can be as small as one billionth of a meter, one nanometer across, or even slightly smaller. And if it gets a little bit bigger, probably around two or three nanometers in diameter, it will start forming other tubes around it, nested tubes, one inside of the other. So when it forms a single tube, we call it a single walled carbon nanotube. And when it forms multiple nested tubes, we call that a multi-wall carbon nanotube. But they all have the same basic structure. Hexagons made up of carbon atoms forming three bonds with each other in a pattern rolled up into a tube that's a few billionths of a meter across. So you mentioned the diameter of the tube. How long can they be? Well, that depends on how you grow them. Nanotubes can grow through two main ways of synthesis. One is something called a substrate growth, which is where you lay the catalyst that grow the tubes out on a plate. And in that case, the tubes grow up what in a way from the plate in a nice little neat forest, like hairs if they were very, very straight. In that case, it takes a long time to grow a tube. A tube might only reach a micron in length in one hour of growth. So that technique is used primarily in laboratories to make materials for study. In industrial production, they can grow tubes that are millimeters long, literally millions of times longer than a plain nanometer. So you can have tubes that range from microns to millimeters, depending on how you grow them. So you've described what a nanotube is with respect to its structure. Can you share a little bit about their properties? That electron I mentioned, which is delocalized, that can move around the tube and that is very good for helping out with things like electrical conduction. Also, depending on how that a slight amount of twist is given to the nanotube. You can also cause the tube to be extremely highly conductive or more like a semiconductor. And so the way they're constructed, their diameter, all affects this very high electrical conductivity. In theory, it can reach that of metals, and yet it's much lighter than a metal made from renewable resources or non-toxic ones. And so electrical properties are things that people would like to explore with nanotubes because in theory they can be extremely electrical and conductive. The other thing is the carbon-carbon bond is very strong and that pattern, that hexagonal pattern, is very interesting when it comes to spreading stress. So if you put a tube under stress, you'd be surprised how strong it is. The tensile strength of a carbon nanotube is almost unbelievable compared to some other materials. Like for example, if I wanted to pick a popular type of Oh, like metal. If I picked steel, steel is about 800, 900 megapascal. That's a rating of its strength. So this would be a stainless steel about 800 to 900 megapascals. A carbon nanotube, on the other hand, can reach 63,000 megapascals in strength. So it's very, very strong. So that mechanical strength, because of those little carbon atoms being arranged in that unique pattern, can give rise to very, very strong materials when you pull on them. So those are two properties that are unique to carbon nanotubes because they're arranged the way they are on the nanoscale. You discuss the electrical properties where, depending on the, the twist or the chirality, they can be either like a conductor or a semiconductor, depending on that twist, as you mentioned, and that they're very strong. So how do people make use of these exciting properties? Well, one thing would be in composited materials, that is combining carbon nanotubes with an existing material because of something in material science called the rule of mixtures. Now, the rule of mixtures is pretty straightforward. 
It simply says that if I put material A and material B together, and material A and B both have a common property, then the composite material will have a property which is just a weighted average, if you want to call it that, of each species contribution to the composite. So if something is 80% material A and 20% material B, then for its property, the composite material will have 80-20 mixtures. So when it came to making composite materials with carbon nanotubes, one application was strength. Because the strength is so high, one should only have to add a small amount to many conventional materials to get a significant boost in properties. And when these composites are made properly, one can see this. In epoxy composites, which are used for aerospace and marine applications, a small amount of carbon nanotubes, something as little as 1% by weight, can give you, a, say, a 20 to 30% increase in tensile strength. And so that's a big deal when you need to look for new ways to boost the performance of things like epoxy composites, which are finding more and more applications in the real world. So I want to get your perspective on potential applications of carbon nanotubes. Where do you see applications taking advantage of the novel properties of these materials in a meaningful way? I see a lot of applications as a material in electrochemical cells for things like flow batteries and fuel cells because of the very high surface area the nanotubes have, the ability to promote certain types of reactions on that surface, and also because the nanotubes being made of carbon can withstand very corrosive environments. And inside of an electrochemical cell, you can have very corrosive environments. And so something like perhaps a lithium battery, uh, replacing graphitic materials in places like that. Graphite is a very good material, but it does not have enough electrochemically active surface area as opposed to nanotubes. And that can constrain performance. Well, Mark, I want to thank you again for taking the time to talk with us today. Do you have any closing thoughts that you would like to share with our listeners? Yes, and that is that um, we should not be disappointed that nanotechnology has taken this long to get to this point. As I said, it is a whole new world. At that level, things change, properties change, interactions between different forms of matter change. And humans go about learning these things by first applying the concepts that work at a different level. And we've seen this before in things like very early studies of the atom, where people came up with things such as the plum pudding model. And it didn't turn out that it was right, but at least it got people thinking. And now we're getting more and more of an understanding about how these things work at this very strange and different level. But we should think about that. Nothing ever comes easy. Nature reveals her secrets very, very rarely. But if you pay attention and you buy yourself, you'll find out that in the end.